Alright, Elden Ring, level 1 at the highest new game cycle. A bit of a different kind of video to end the year with. This is a compilation of the major boss fights of Elden Ring at R1, Nuka Plus 7, but with an additional theme. Namely that the weapons I'm using are not exactly ones that you see often in level 1 runs. To be clear, it's a theme rather than a restriction, so there are a few exceptions here and there. In fact, it's a bit of a fluke that it turned out this way, since the initial theme were serpentine weapons. But in the end, my weapons of choice in this run were the deadly poison weapons. Which are the venomous fang, the serpent bow, the serpent bone blade and the coral shield. Not exactly the most effective weapons for this type of challenge. In fact, deadly poison is not even the most status effective. However, having said that, as you will see, these weapons and even the poison itself may actually be more effective than you might think. Now of course level 1 runs in Elder Ring are already kind of broken because of the absurd amount of stat boosting you can do in this game, which makes your actual level not even all that meaningful. However the upside is that it does allow for a lot of variety. Now I am going to provide commentary for every fight, but even though it's a bit of an old school style video for my channel, it is certainly not meant to be a guide. I mean, who do you think I am? K&M gaming guides or something? In fact, this video is kind of the result of me trying to get better at these fights. So it's a training session that got a bit out of hand. But in all fairness, my approaches are definitely not the most effective. And against some of the bosses I hardly ever fight, I wasn't even all that sure what the hell I was doing in the first place. So it's not a dissection of bosses movesets or an in-depth explanation of strategies and tactics or whatever. I also wouldn't want to call it random rambling. Emphasis on want, because I guess I should. Regardless, hardly anyone would want to watch this in the first place if I don't pour the buttery smooth liquid chocolate that is my voice in their ears. Given how many people have told me that they like to fall asleep to the sound of my voice. Yeah, I don't get it either. Anyway, this is Elden Ring. Room level 1. Nuke in plus 7. Using deadly poison weapons. So, we start off against Margaret using a very special weapon, namely the Coral Shield. A weapon with a bit of a twist, because the shield itself only inflicts regular poison, whereas the weapon art, the actual Viper Bite, inflicts deadly poison. However, given that these are not truly separate status effects, if you make sure that you proc the effect using the Viper Bite, you can use regular shield bashes to build up the poison. But that also implies the opposite, that if you proc the effect with a shield bash, even if you use the Viper Bite to build up the poison, the result will be regular poison instead. Because the difference between deadly and regular is the length of time it's active and the amount of damage it does per tick. In fact, one of the other weapons I will be using in this playthrough has a little quirk regarding this mechanic. Now the way I handle Margit and a lot of other bosses as well, especially his real version Morgoth, is that I use a sort of minimalist approach when it comes to dealing with his moveset. And what I mean by that is that I wait for very specific attacks that are easy to punish and don't punish any other attacks, meaning I simply avoid those instead. And these are the jump and slow charging overhead attack in the first phase, and the hammer jump attack and the forward jump followed by a slow stab in the second phase. And this type of approach is very effective but obviously less efficient in the sense that you miss attack opportunities by design and therefore lengthen the fight. But it is a quite common tactic I use to quickly learn how to take down a boss when I'm not yet familiar with the boss's moveset, and sometimes that approach simply sticks if it proves to be consistently effective. 
even when I get more experience at a boss fight. When doing challenge runs, where you often have to use a pretty shitty attack, and then it allows you to be able to do challenge runs quickly, because you only have to learn how to deal with a handful of moves or less. And as I said, sometimes this approach will change over time, when I get more familiar with a boss's moveset, but other times it just sticks and Market is an example of that. Only downside is that he has an RNG element to a lot of moves, and in particular when he jumps towards you in the second phase, he doesn't necessarily follow up with a slow stab into the ground, but he can actually do a quick double slash with his dagger. So that can be quite annoying, because you do have to wait a split second to make sure that he does follow up in the correct way. So it's definitely not the quickest method in execution, but it's easy to learn and patience can definitely be a virtue in these types of games. Alright, for Godric we're sticking with the Coil Shield, and paradoxically it's kind of a shame that this was a second attempt victory, because looking back, I think you can actually sneak in, or snake in I guess, a lot of extra hits using the Viper Bite's reach, because you tend to stay at a sort of mid distance a lot, waiting for Godric's very, uh, well, unnaturally slow combos to end, which I guess is one of the consequences of putting in so many delayed attacks in this game, because as a result, the movement of certain bosses looks quite unnatural. And not in the sense of him being a monstrosity in a magical world, but in the sense that there was no reason for him to swing his axes like that, other than because of video game logic. But you know, it is clear that uh, players are getting too skilled at these games, and one of the ways of preventing roll spam is by baiting players into getting roll cut by increasing the gap between the startup of an attack and when it actually strikes. Anyway, the thing that didn't come to mind at the time was that you have more reach with the Viper Bite than with most melee weapons. So for example when you're staying just outside of the wind AoE to bait his Godric roll where he jumps over you. Well, he mostly does, I wish he would never let me down. But sometimes he still does the two wind projectiles, even when you're just outside of the two AoEs. And I'm pretty sure that the Viper Bite would be able to reach him from that safe position. Speaking of which, the Viper Bite does a surprising amount of damage for something meant to quickly inflict poison. Although it inflicts almost no poise damage, however by jumping over the ground AoEs, you can still manage to get a poise break from shield bashes. Although unfortunately, small shields are only on the level of straight swords, when it comes to poise damage. Now when Godric disarms himself in order to become armed and dangerous, he actually becomes kind of less dangerous. Since his dragon arm is mostly used for range attacks, and you're mostly safe when you're close to him. In fact, in principle that even applies to when he breathes fire downwards, where half the arena in front of him becomes a dead zone. Because if you react immediately to it, you can get behind it and avoid the flames altogether. Meaning you get a large window for safe attacks on top of that. Which I, uh, well, uh, <laughs> repeatedly failed to do actually in this particular fight. And therefore I had to run a marathon each time to get out of the blast zone. I don't know, maybe that's a reflex left over from when the game was first released. Because if you guys remember, when the game was unpatched, that hitbox was a bit uh, Dark Souls 2-y, where even if you were behind it, it would hit you without visually connecting. Or maybe it's more appropriate to say it was a bit Fire Giant-y, because as you will see later on, or might remember from previous runs, that boss's Fire Breath has a peculiar hitbox as well. Regardless, Godric is actually one of my favorite Shard Bearer fights, in fact, if they had made the wind-up of the wind stomp AoE a little bit longer, it would have been practically perfect in my opinion.
face of gold. Alright, for the fight against the Red Wolf, I switched to the Serpent Bow, which in and of itself adds only regular poison. However, it also boosts the buildup of deadly poison when you use the Serpent Arrows. And well, you would think that a bow would give you a reach advantage, since that's kind of the whole point of using a bow in the first place. But it is a pretty slow attack, which is not exactly helpful against an enemy that uses multiple projectiles and can close the distance rather quickly. On top of that, as you will see at the end, given that the AI responds to ranged attacks by dodging, it actually kind of ended up breaking his AI. And well, then weird stuff can happen. So basically even when you have a ranged attack, you're still better off fighting him in the same way you would fight him with a melee weapon. But even when doing that, because it's still a ranged attack, the AI will respond to it as if it is a ranged attack, making the Red Wolf a little bit uh, jumpy and therefore quite unpredictable. So any other deadly poison weapon, including the coil shield, would arguably have been a more effective weapon in this fight. So, what the hell is even happening here? It's like an overactive child with HDHD uh, during a sugar rush. And that was some crap of the delicious variety. Well, it, it does still count as a victory. Does that also still count as no damage by the way? Because it's after you... Nah. I don't even know myself, but I say, fuck it, a win is a win. But yeah, that was a bit, uh, a bit of a kick in the nets. Well, I'm not the biggest fan of Ronaldo's first phase under these kinds of circumstances. I mean, the atmosphere is absolutely great, of course. And once you realize that the scholar with the shield is the only one singing, which helps you find her much easier, since you can follow the sound. But uh, getting randomly hit by a book from off screen, especially when they conveniently forgot to put a stake of America right outside of the door. Yeah, that's not the greatest thing in a two phase fight. But the thing is that any damage is sufficient to break the shield. And therefore I equipped the gauntlets of the Briar Armor set, meaning I can just roll instead of attack. Which might incidentally cause me to dodge any incoming book. In fact, 9 out of 10 times when you take a hit in the first phase, it is the moment you initiate an attack and cannot appropriately respond to incoming flying literature. Now, as you can see I am using the Venomous Fang in both hands, which has a surprising amount of DPS. But unfortunately just not enough to one cycle her, as the poison is almost useless in the first phase, since she can only die outside of her shield. Meaning that the poison will just deplete her health down to 1 HP. And therefore you still need to get her down again. However, speaking of the poison, the Venomous Fang has innate deadly poison buildup. So what happens when you stack a poison infusion on top of that? Well, then you activate a very interesting little gimmick, that as far as I know is actually unique to this particular weapon. Because the result is that the damage over time is the combination of the damage of deadly poison with the time that regular poison is active. In other words, you have even deadlier poison. How useful that actually is is a bit questionable though, given that you sacrifice DPS, since poison infusion reduces the base damage of a weapon. Regardless, as I said, this weapon already has a surprising amount of DPS, even on level 1. In fact, by now, since patch 1.08 is out, the DPS would have been even higher since the attack animation of claw weapons were sped up in that patch. Now this footage is from far before that. Regardless, remember that this entire video is the result of a quote unquote training session gone out of hand. So depending on the boss encounter, the point wasn't even to maximize damage output in the first place. I was simply trying to get better at these fights. In fact, it's all kind of arbitrary what I use at what time. So whenever you wonder, hey, why don't you use this item, or this weapon art, or that particular buff in this fight? Or why do you use a great rune here, but not there? Well, sometimes it can be because I like or do not like a particular boss fight. But even more likely, that there simply is no reason to begin with. It's completely arbitrary. Or to remain in the spirit of the game, no reason in particular, I claimest. I mean, you've heard of rhetorical questions, uh, so I suppose there's also such a thing as a rhetorical answer.
Alright, the fourth and final deadly poison weapon, the Serpent Bone Blade. Which actually has a really nice moveset. Because Charge R2's are not only quick, but it's a double slash. And the weapon art is also a double slash, in fact that's the name of it, which does more damage than a non charge R2. So lots of double hit opportunities with this weapon. Which helps with both poise damage as well as poison buildup. Especially because this particular weapon doesn't have that much of either. Now of course against Draconic Tree Sentinel, stance breaking is not as effective as against most other bosses, given that you cannot repose them. And on Nukem Plus 7 it takes a lot more to poise break anything to begin with. Now for the handful of people who have seen my blind playthrough, where I mainly use daggers, you know how much I struggled with this particular fight, however that did force me to learn it very early on. However I do have a habit to dodge to the left, which I suppose is a general tendency I tend to have, as moving left just feels more natural to me. So whenever you see me fight a boss where I primarily move the other way around, chances are that I initially started off moving clockwise and then change it when I realized it was less effective in that particular fight. However, sometimes it just sticks regardless because it is beneficial to dodge the other way around in this particular fight, namely towards the boss's shield side instead of what I do, towards his actual weapon side. After all, it's not like he can actually block with his shield and his shield attacks are quite slow. And on top of that, his weapon has shock waves that need to be dodged as well, especially in the second phase with the lightning. And you will always have to watch out that after he does a jump attack towards you, whether he does a quick follow up or a delayed follow up in order to safely attack him from behind. So I suppose that I kind of taught myself a less effective approach here, but it is kind of ingrained at this point. Regardless, in general it is beneficial to allow him to come to you, so to bait that jump attack, which you can only do to an extent because of course he tends to spam his fireballs quite a lot. However, you can squeeze in roll attacks as long as you remember that when the horse stands up on his hind legs, the fireball goes directly down onto the ground and is delayed. Now a lot of people actually parry this guy even though you cannot repose him, which I wasn't going for in this fight to begin with, nor do I have a lot of experience with doing that. But you can actually parry his giant lightning charge ground slam after he does his arguably most dangerous attack where he scrapes his weapon over the ground causing a giant wave of lightning. So I always run away as far as I can after dodging that. But it is actually possible to parry that attack, which even allows you to attack him while he is charging up. Regardless, I simply tend to take things slowly anyway. So I let him come to me, dodge for his jump attack, and act accordingly to either the quick or delayed follow up. And if he's close enough, punish his fireballs whenever he is spamming them. <laughs> Which is uh, quite often. I mean despite his name, it's the horse that is draconic, not the tree sentinel. I guess. Or both. Or something, I don't know. Okay, for the Shade version of Godfrey I don't have anything specific to say, because it's the same moveset as the first phase of the real Godfrey. But what I do want to say is that I actually really enjoy this fight, because it's just a straightforward, no-nonsense souls fight. Just fighting a big dude with a big axe. So no weird delayed attacks, no bullshit AoEs. Heck, the ground AoE stomp attack is an actual attack opportunity, perfectly suited for a jump attack. Well, depending on the weapon of course. I suppose some people will find this sort of fight boring, but when you think about souls in the early days, Artorias was like this as well. I mean no crazy combos, delays, giant AoEs and fuck you attacks in that fight either. And Artorias is a classic boss fight that aged quite well, in my opinion at least.
All right, I mentioned the minimalist approach before against Margit, which I also use against Morgoth. However, in this particular instance, I got caught off guard at the start of the fight, since he did his spear charge in his first phase, which I have never seen before when he's still at full health. Regardless, the move I wait for is spear related, but it's the spear throw that he does. Because in the first phase, as long as you're at a distance, he will follow with a jump attack, which has a large window of opportunity for you to counterattack. And he quite often throws a spear if you stay away from him. However, when he goes into second phase, after he summons the Swords of Damocles attack, that's when he gain, well, that's when he should gain his spear charge, which you can roll through diagonally to the right, and you can use a roll attack to get a hit in. Now, he also gains one move that I cannot consistently avoid, and that's this one, where he dashes forward and spins around with his hammer. I do avoid it here, and I've avoided it many times, but sometimes, even if you roll away from it, it somehow still hits you, and it's not clear to me exactly what makes a difference when it doesn't and when it does hit you. So for me at least that is his most dangerous move for that reason. Now whenever you roll through a spear charge, he will also follow up with a hammer swing. Which you can outspace and then you can get a single running attack in. However, then you will have to avoid a counter attack, which can be an overhead smash with a hammer, but more commonly it's a delayed attack with a sword. So because of that delay, you need to resist the urge to immediately roll away, otherwise it will likely result in a roll catch. Now he can still do the jump attack after throwing a spear, but that is very rare in the second phase. However, when he goes into his third phase, or second form if you will, then at least it becomes a bit more frequent again. Although I don't count on that happening, because in this phase he gains his bloodsword attacks, which he does quite a lot, and if he points his sword towards you, like in a stabbing position, or sort of similar to the stance position of a longsword if you will, then it will be a single attack with a slow recovery, so a large window for you to attack, but if he raises the sword upwards, it's similar to Margaret's charged overhead attack. So when you're at a distance, he will attack a second time with a spinning slash. Meaning you can only counterattack after rolling twice. Now, because it's essentially the same as Margaret's version, if he does it when you're close, if you then get to his side, he won't do that second spinning attack. Meaning you have an even larger window of opportunity to counterattack. But given that I tend to stay far away from him, I don't tend to risk running towards him. So once more, I rather play it safe. So focusing on only those specific attacks and avoiding all the others, May not sound efficient, but it is so effective that not only did I beat him here first try, which is surprising on Nugent Plus 7, but back in March when I did my first level 1 run, which was only my third proper playthrough, I beat him on the first attempt there as well. So in that sense, if a method proves to be effective, then there's not really any reason to change it, I suppose. Well, contrary to Morgoth, my approach to the Fire Giant has changed a lot since my first playthroughs. Well, at least for the second phase. First phase is mainly about DPS and uh, hoping that uh, the camera doesn't fuck you over. So I have the Venomous Fang and I'm even wearing the Raptor set to boost my jump attacks. So obviously I'm immediately going to do jump... Uh, uh, okay, maybe it's just for fashion. Oh, there we go, there we go. Well, that's something at least. 
Also, whenever you need to get on Torn to uh, close the distance, you can immediately do a jump attack while dismounting. So, that's another thing, I guess. Now, you would think that the Hyper Poison of the Venomous Fang would be especially helpful against a boss with a giant health pool like this. And I suppose it is. However, although in the first phase you deal with the largest section of the boss's health bar, that phase goes by rather quickly. But the second phase takes a lot longer and you get way less attack opportunities. So, that is where it kind of shines. Although, in all fairness, if you look at the health bar when the poison is active, it's not exactly ticking like a motherfucker. I mean, it's still not comparable to Rot after all. Or heck, stacking poison with Rot. Which, to be clear, would technically be possible by buffing the Venomous Fang with Rot Grease. Although then, of course, you cannot also have the poison infusion. Anyway, what I used to do back in the early uh, days of the game is that I tried to attack the giant from behind in the second phase. Mainly going for the one lag that still remains. And although that is sort of a safish approach, it is really drawn out. Because you just do so little damage unless you are using bleed damage. So you actually need to stay in front of him and attack his hands instead. So whenever he rolls away, you need to get in front of him again as fast as you can. Because you want him to attack with his hands as much as possible. Not only because those provide you with attack opportunities, but his most dangerous attacks are far more common when there's distance between him and you. Not merely his fireballs, which I actually prefer to avoid by jumping rather than rolling, or the ever annoying floating fire orbs that uh, chase you around and explode, but his ranged fire breath is the stuff of nightmares, because not only is it really hard to see what exactly the hitbox of it is, but whatever it is, it has proven itself to be a little... Uh, Noxal Stewie. I've had some peculiar deaths from it before in earlier videos, if you recall. In fact, I technically got hit by it in this very fight as well. But in the heat of the moment, Torrent decided to take the damage on my behalf. What a stallion. Which I guess is the horse equivalent of saying what a chat. So he's not merely helpful to close the distance, but he's also a steed that can take the heat. And it's pretty neat. Alright, I'm actually including the two god skins separately, because when you're forced to fight them together, I will be doing more cheesing than fighting. And therefore I wanted to include the actual individual fights. Now, when it comes to the noble, I usually went for a parry strategy, but that's actually quite risky. Especially when you're not all that great at parrying. Instead, I actually make use of Quickstep this time, which was the skill I had on the Venomous Fang from the beginning. But the thing with the Noble is, is that you're better off not circling around the boss, as is a common approach against, uh, well, pretty much any boss. But uh, the Noble's Hokey Pokey moveset, and especially the cramped boss arena, makes it easier to move back and forth. However, that actually has an additional benefit. Because it means that you constantly return to being at a sort of mid-distance, which is often enough to trigger him to throw a black fireball. Which he would also do if you stay far away, but when you're at mid-distance, you can turn that into an attack opportunity, because you can quickly close the distance, which will make the fireball go over your head, meaning you have a safe attack opportunity. Especially very helpful in the second phase, where he becomes much more dangerous. And it's not merely him going into limb biscuit mode that makes him so dangerous, because he actually has an attack that's much worse than rolling. In fact, one that is sort of comparable to a Cyrus's insta-charge. Namely, the Noble Presence, you know, the incantation that you get from defeating him. Because that is pretty much an instant hitbox, so you cannot react to it. Instead, you need to dodge it before it actually happens. 
Now, in the first phase, he can already do that move, but without the black flames around it. However, then it does no damage, so you can pretty much ignore it. But in the second phase, right after you get an attack in, you need to immediately move back again, because at any time, after he recovers from his own attack, he can essentially insta-kill you. And as far as I know, there's nothing that indicates that it's coming. So therefore you need to make a habit of anticipating it, so when it actually happens, you essentially automatically avoid it. Okay, so just like with the Noble, the same principle applies to the Apostle, that you can bait and then punish his black fireballs by being at mid distance. But on top of that, if you run towards him, you can trigger his jump attack for an easy punish. In fact, sometimes this can cause him to jump over you, meaning you don't even have to dodge it. Although in this particular fight he was being a little bit passive for some reason. Which is not necessarily a bad thing when the poison is slowly draining away his health. And in general, I tend to take things slowly with this guy anyway. And when he goes stretchy noodle mode in his second phase, it's helpful to let him come to you, except for the transition itself, because if you stick directly behind him, he cannot hit you. Although it is a pretty small space where it's actually safe. But after that, you can bait fireballs, or let him come to you since you can roll through most of what he does, and then attack his legs. Or the lower part of his body, whatever. Now, I must say that I actually like the Apostle a lot more than the Noble, even though initially it was the other way around, but that was because back then I was at least somewhat familiar with the Noble's moveset. Whereas the Apostle is over here and in the Divine Tower, so pretty much nothing would bring you to those places to begin with in pretty much any playthrough. Now it's not exactly true because my next playthrough will probably lead me to this place in particular. But yeah, fighting both of the godskins at once under these circumstances is about as fun as scraping dried up shit stains from a toilet bowl. So this fight is just a matter of a lot of buffing and uh, sleep authorization. So here I use the Venomous Fang for DPS, including Talisman and Tear Boost for consecutive attacks. Because that allows you to drain each of the health bars past 50% before they get the chance to attack. Although twice in a row, the Apostle actually trolled me. Because I was expecting him to go into his second phase, but he counterattacked instead. What a thin flappy dick. In fact, when I killed the fat one, he almost respawned right on top of me. Now, another benefit of being able to do quick attacks in succession is the fact that they actually continue to take damage from the collective health bar, even when you hit them after their own health bar reaches zero, so during their death animation. And that allows for a nice amount of bonus damage. So that way, even on nuking plus seven, you can give the foreskin duo a quick little cut off the top. You know, as in uh, circumcision. You know, where, uh, like, weird play. Yeah, dumb fight.
Alright, but after one of the worst fights, now it's time for arguably my favorite boss fight in the game. Although I definitely had to switch to the Serpent Bone Blade for this fight. Because one, I guess, sort of flaw with this design is that fist weapons and daggers tend to automatically miss when you attack him from the front, where you essentially hit the space underneath him. Regardless, other than using roll attacks, after dodging through his attacks, what I mainly watch out for is that slow sweeping attack that he does. He can do that at basically any time, but it's extremely common after he does that quick double swipe with his dagger. Unfortunately, you can't really determine that from this footage alone. But pay attention the next time you fight him, because you will see how common it is, and that will make him actually quite predictable. What it did not predict, however, is how many hits it took to proc the poison. Which in all fairness were not that many, but I honestly remembered him being explicitly weak to it. But I guess that's like some weird personal Mandela effect. Because according to the wikis he's not, so either I misremember it, or it's an early patch thing or something. Probably the former. I do notice that a lot of other people fight him in a quite different way, and explicitly bait him to keep comboing until he does the dagger attack from up high where he stands all the way up. Because with heavy weapons that allows you to get charge attacks in to break his poise. But of course that wouldn't have worked that well with this weapon to begin with. Now if you've seen my original level 1 run back in March, then you know that the problem I ran into with Malekith was the RNG of how he follows up after the combo with the slow overhead attack in the middle, where he sometimes does the destined death weapon art as a follow up and sometimes he doesn't. Because the thing is that you can punish the destined death attack by getting to his side in time so that you're outside of that massive hitbox. But more often than not, trying to do that was exactly what got me killed. So by now I just don't bother with that to begin with. You can easily avoid it by moving back instead. Now that does mean that you won't get an attack opportunity, but it also entails that you can be as aggressive as you want during that slow overhead, because it doesn't really matter whether he follows up or not. So it's once again a matter of uh, playing it safe being, uh, well, well, safer. Kind of by, by definition. Also by definition it's not the quickest way, but it's simply effective by being reliable. Now whenever he is jumping around anime style, I try to move away from him, because one dangerous move is where he stabs down into the ground, where it's not the AoE but the sword itself that hits you. After all, because of the AoE, it's a double hitbox, so it's much easier if you only have to avoid the AoE and not also the sword itself. Especially because it can be hard to time, because the camera can be right up in your face if Malekith is up in the air right above you. Oh, by the way, even though his growl does no damage and only knocks you on your ass, my advice would be to avoid it anyway, because it can place you in an unfavorable position right after you recover from it. Alright, Placid Usex, the, I guess sort of Madeir of Elden Ring, but also not really. Other than his laser attack, it's actually quite the opposite kind of fight, given that you are mainly attacking his tail, and for the most part in between lightning attacks. In fact, even when he swipes at you with his claw, followed by his fire breath, the way you can stay just outside of the hitbox is by running into his tail, and the moment he pulls his tail back, you are free to attack without having to worry about getting clipped by the fire. In fact, as long as you're attacking his tail, his fire breath and the random lightning are the only things that can hit you to begin with. So in a sense this fight is actually pretty straightforward. It's simply a massive endurance test, because the lower the boss's health bar gets, the less attack opportunities you get. So the first phase goes by rather quickly, but after he disappears for the first time, uh, the fight will really, dare I say it? Eh, fuck it, drag on. Now technically there are some places where he could sneak in an extra hit here and there. When he disappears and reappears he's only there for a short while before he vanishes again. However when you're constantly one hit away from death in a lengthy fight like this, you kind of tend to make it even lengthier by playing things extra safe. 
In fact, one massive damage opportunity, at least in principle, is actually when he goes nuclear on your ass and also half of the arena, when he does the giant bolt of grand sex attack. Now, it doesn't really apply when using these weapons, but in principle, if you have a weapon with high poise damage, or are using Flame of the Red Mains or something similar, well, I guess that no longer applies now where patch 1.08 is out, but the point is that that would be the perfect opportunity to stagger him, because staggering him will in fact cancel that attack altogether. But of course the Venerous Fang does very little uh, poise damage to begin with, unless you would actually apply Flame of the Red Mains to it, which you can do in fact, but it was my goal to not use it in his run. Oh, by the way, on a side note, that also answers how you could avoid that attack when playing a randomizer where Placidusex spawns in a smaller arena than the area of effect of the equivalent of a nuclear weapon. At least if you can do enough poise damage relatively quickly, you wouldn't necessarily have to be outside of the blast zone. Now, when Placidusex disappears, he will swoop down upon you, and I actually find it easier to avoid him by running towards him, especially the second time, given that it was often the AoE around him when he lands that got me killed, rather than a direct hit from the boss himself. And as I said, technically when he is uh, disappearing and reappearing, you can dodge through his attack and get a single attack of your own in, but that is very risky. So I suppose maybe in hindsight I should have also had the Serpent Bow equipped. That would have made it a little easier to get some extra hits in. I don't think the damage would have been that great, but, but it could have sped up the process a little bit. Because this is a very, very lengthy fight this way.
Alright, the real version of Godfrey and probably my second favorite fight in the game, after Malekith. This is for the most part a straightforward, no-nonsense battle with almost no downtime. You are constantly on the attack and so is he. I don't actually do it here, but you don't have to roll every X-Wing that he does. Because when you're circling around him, with the correct spacing, you can stay behind his X altogether. So that does allow for some extra hits, or at least allows you to preserve stamina. And unless you're using an Alter Greatsword, even his stomp attacks are attack opportunities. Depending on the weapon, it can even be a jumping R2 for some nice poise damage. In fact, the Serpent Bone Blade has such quick attacks that you even get a lot of charged R2s in. Therefore, even though he has a lot of poise, especially on Nuka Plus 7, and this is not exactly the best weapon for poise damage, you are still almost guaranteed to break his stance, since there won't be enough downtime for him to recover his poise. In fact, even with just L2 or even R1 attacks, it's still likely to happen. When he goes Giga Chat mode, he becomes a bit more dangerous, but still quite straightforward, because as a general rule of thumb, if you circle around him counterclockwise, you will mostly be able to attack, dodge a single attack from him, and then counterattack again. Of course, he will do his death metal growl or rip the entire arena apart, meaning that you are forced to move away. So then it's best to wait for his delayed jumping grab attack, you know, the one with the extra airtime. Then when you've closed the distance, you can focus on getting a single attack in, and for the most part dodge a single attack, which you will likely be able to repeat several times, because except for his frantic sideswipe combo, which is for that reason arguably his most dangerous move, it's really only single attacks that you need to avoid that way. Now you do have to watch out for his grab though, because it's so delayed, however since you're circling anyway, you can actually outspace it without dodging at all. It has tracking, but it's not that extreme. Oh, and uh, when he goes into his final phase, remember that when he smashes the ground, his hands themselves have a hitbox as well. As some of you know, I learned, uh, learned that the hard way. <laughs> oh, whoa, that almost went wrong at the end. I guess the poison might have saved me from getting squashed by this giant hunk of man meat at the last possible moment. So I guess one man's meat is another man's poison. Or something, I don't know. Oh boy, it's our big boy Radan. Yeah, I don't know why, but as most of you know by now, this boss has always given me a lot of trouble. And no matter what I do, I never seem to actually get a true grasp on his moveset. On top of that, it, it took me ages to actually realize that it's not a double hitbox at all when he stamps his foot down, followed by a quick sword swipe. You only need to dodge the actual sword itself. Probably because his feet are kind of, uh, well, uh, non-existent. And especially, of course, the gravity wave across the ground is something that I always uh, seem to get hit by. No matter whether I choose to roll or jump. For whatever reason, I always mistime it. So basically, whenever I win in this fight, it is because I DPS my way through it. And ironically, and maybe surprisingly, this particular fight was no exception to that. And it wasn't even intentional. First of all, as you would know by now, the Venomous Fang has quite a lot of DPS. But there are two moves that Rodan is pretty much guaranteed to do, which allow you to get a ton of damage in. And I got three of those opportunities in this particular fight. The first one is when he goes into his second phase where he applies the gravity magic to his swords. Because if you stay close enough, you can freely attack Lanard instead and avoid the attack altogether. And the same applies in his third phase, after transforming into a meteorite. Because you can attack poor old Lanard as well, while Rodan is summoning the giant boulders from the ground. And the thing is, I didn't even have to worry about any of his third phase attacks, because he did the weapon art again, which allowed me to finish the fight. So yeah, I definitely got some really favorable RNG here, which is the main reason I won in the first place, I suppose. Because uh, whenever I do have to deal with his third phase, it never seems to go all that well. And I don't even know what the X factor is that makes this particular fight so difficult for me to learn. Also, attacking the horse does make me feel uh, a little bit sad. But attacking him does make the fight a lot easier, so whenever I do get that opportunity, I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. 
Unfortunately, it's more like you're shitting a gift horse in the mouth, but it, it, it is what it is. Anyway, enough horsing around. It's now time for Loretta. And for this fight, I'm actually parrying. In fact, I very much prefer to fight her this way. And to stay true to the snake theme, which was the initial theme, I'm using the Man Serpent Shield to parry with. Which makes absolutely no meaningful difference at all with Golden Parry, but whatever. What does make a difference, however, is that this is the real version of Loretta, who unlike the ghost version, is susceptible to status effects. But of course also has way more health and an extended moveset, so that is not actually much of a benefit, I suppose. Now when it comes to parrying, all or at least most of her war scythe attacks can be parried, but I mainly allow her to come to me, you know, Draconic Tree Sentinel style, because the easiest attack to parry, for me at least, is the stab she does after the jumping overhead attack. Meaning I roll through that overhead attack and then parry the stab. Then I do a charge R2, which knocks her back since she cannot be reposted. And then I do a jump attack before she recovers. Now depending on how she follows up, you could immediately parry her again. However, since she can follow up in multiple ways, that would likely result in me getting killed. So for the most part at least, I don't try to do that. Also, depending on your position, you can roll through her projectiles to get a roll attack in. In fact, when she uses her magic great bow, it's best to run towards her given that the arrow hitting the ground does do splash damage. So that's ultimately safer than rolling through it when you don't have to. And it can allow for a free hit in the process. However, when she goes into second phase, she will use the Loretta Mastery version, which shoots multiple arrows. Which is annoying as fuck because I very often die from the splash damage, even when I think I've timed my roll perfectly. So that would be another reason to get as close as possible to her. However, that becomes much more trickier in the second phase, because her phalanx projectiles are doubled as well. And you would want to run sideways to simply outstrafe those, but her homing projectiles that she shoots from the back end of her weapon, and I'm still sort of salty that we don't have any of those abilities when using her weapon because it looks pretty cool, but the point is that those are much easier to avoid by rolling forward, given that they home in on you. So even when things seem to go perfectly, the second phase quite often get me killed because of those little differences. Or of course because of inconsistent parries, because uh, I'm not exactly a parry master. And the thing is that you will need a lot of successful parries to take her down on Nukem Plus 7. And there we are, the inevitable confrontation with Mrs. Waterfall herself. Speaking of which, given the lack of Bloodhound step, depending on the weapon you're using, and my over-reliance on it to begin with, I actually tried to practice dodging it up close using this weird turnaround strategy that you might be familiar with. Well, after many attempts I did manage to pull it off, but uh, uh, I kind of settled on cancelling the move altogether with a freezing pot. So uh, there you go. Now, to be fair, I could still have used Bloodhound Step by using the Venomous Fang. However, that's not a very effective weapon against Melania, given that it's all about DPS and Melania is designed to prevent getting comboed. That's why she has so many hyper armor moves and even that weird backwards twirl to create distance from you whenever you get multiple hits on her in a short interval. Which actually does have a benefit, because if you immediately chase after her, you can get a free jump attack in. And speak of jump attacks, in general I am... Well, I'm mainly using jump attacks in this fight. Which is why I'm suddenly wielding two Serpent Bone Blades rather than one. Even though this boss actually provides a lot of opportunities for charge or two attacks. In fact, even when using an Ultra Greatsword. And actually, initially I did go for that. As the Serpent Bone Blades double slash, both R2 as well as the weapon art, is actually quite effective against Melania. 
In fact, it can even cancel any non-hyper armor attacks she does. However, relying on that in a lengthy fight will likely mean that RNG will get you killed. And given that I mainly rely on jump attacks for the second phase anyway, well, way too much to be honest, I ended up just dual wielding instead. Given that any opportunity for a charge or two is obviously a large enough window for a jump attack. Uh, actually with one exception, namely her giant stabbing leap attack, because she can actually dodge backwards right after doing that. Which as far as I can tell, is actually explicitly a response to jump attacks. So after dodging that particular move, it's safer to do an L1 instead. Now the first phase is way shorter than the second one, because you can get a lot more attacks in, well at least the way I handle the second phase, which is definitely not the most efficient way I suppose. But as you will notice in the first half of the first phase, I do in fact take a lot more risk, because you can actually sneak in a lot of jump attacks, or hack even charts or two attacks with an actual ultra greatsword, whenever she's idle or just slowly moving sideways. But the thing is that she can, at any time, do that jumping forward slash which has hyper armor. So that's the thing, it's not actually truly safe to attack her like that. It's just that more often than not, it just turns out that you won't get hit. And that makes sneaking in those kinds of attacks kind of uh, tempting. And therefore at the start of the fight I simply take a ton of risk and as the fight progresses I become a little bit more passive in that sense. Unfortunately in the second phase I get a little bit too passive because well you simply get way more practice on the first phase for obvious reasons. So I end up playing things a little bit too safe when it comes to a second phase. Because when it comes to a second phase, based on how I've seen other people fight Melania, a lot of people squeeze in attacks when she jumps sideways or even when she does a hyper armor spin, which she tends to spam a lot so it's understandable to want to turn that into an attack opportunity. But I never really dare to take that risk. So other than the attack opportunities that remain from phase 1, like after her lunging stab, the dash forward where she attacks twice and then does the delayed sweep attack which indicates that there's no follow up or whenever she does a sideways attack where she basically leaves her sword hanging there which also indicates no follow up so that's how I know that I can safely do a jump attack in those circumstances so that's not an example of just uh, randomly taking risk but what I mainly look for are obviously the attacks where she hits the ground causing the butterfly effect and no not the time travel thing or the Aston Kutcher movie or the rot explosion if you will now in principle it is not so bad if you go through the second phase rather slowly I mean we know the virtue of patience by now, and it's a lengthy fight regardless. But it's simply that the longer the fight takes, the higher the chance of something going wrong, and obviously only one wrong move is enough to end the attempt. And there are two main issues in the second phase, other than obviously the waterfall which is even less expected in this phase, but also fortunately a lot rarer. But the first thing that often gets me killed is when she jumps up in the air but does not do an attack that hits the ground creating the butterfly explosion but instead lands on her feet and then does a quick slash forward. Because that tends to completely catch me off guard, given that she is constantly jumping up, which by the way also makes it harder to tell when she actually does the waterfall, given that she never jumps up in the first phase other than for that particular move. But in the end, the biggest issue for me is the clone attack, because although I know in principle how dodging that attack works, I am hardly ever able to successfully pull it off. So the only thing that has truly ever worked for me is just running away from it. Which is precisely what I did in this particular fight. Of course the problem with that is exactly the same problem as with the waterfall dance. I mean that one you can also outrun as long as you roll into the second or if you can outrun that one as well into the final flurry. But of course when she does it right in your face then you don't have that option. And the same thing applies to the clone attack. Because the final stabs reach halfway across the arena. In a failed attempt I actually even tried to cancel it with a freezing pot, which in principle should work. However I simply got hit before I could even throw it. And to be clear, yes I have seen how to roll each clone and I've even done it myself basically on accident. But the problem is doing it consistently. And because of the delay on especially the third clone, that can be a massive pain in the dick. So in that sense, for me at least, that attack is even more dangerous than a waterfall.
Okay, for Moog I actually included both versions, because as most of you know, I hate the Lord of Blood version, which to my surprise is not a commonly held opinion, for fuck knows what conceivable reasons, but I have somewhat slowly grown to appreciate this regular version, although there they had to screw it up with the arena, given that the pews inside of this room can literally block your way, so you have to hope that either he clears the area for you, or sometimes you literally have to roll not in order to evade, but in order to make sure that you can evade in the first place, instead of getting stuck. But at least once you learn to deal with Moog's delayed attacks, it's actually a decent fight. Mainly because the blood on the floor isn't as random and constant as in the second phase of the Lord of Blood version. Although ironically, by extending the first phase moveset over a giant life bar like this, it does make it feel a little bit limited. And I cannot do any bonus damage to him from poison, because for some reason this version is immune to all status effects. Whereas the Lord of Blood version isn't. I mean it's pretty much a meme by now that he is actually weak to bleed damage. So I suppose you could say that this is an illusory copy of the real one, just like Ghost of Loretta is immune to status effects, whereas the real version isn't. However, wouldn't that also then have to apply to Market, as he is not immune to status effects? So hey, who the hell knows? So the thing is that I did include the Lord of Blood version for completion's sake basically. But here I just DPS my way through it so I would only have to deal with the random bullshit of the second phase for a short while. And therefore I was simply stacking buff upon buff and have my health just low enough to be on the very edge of being in hyper mode. But still high enough that I can survive the nihil damage given that the crystal tier meant to counteract it doesn't actually negate all of the damage for whatever reason. And also very relevant here were the blood boil aromatic, not merely for the extra damage, but also for the extra stamina, to get as many attacks in as possible. You know, a lot of people have speculated that Michaela's, pupa, uh, Michaela's cocoon will be the entry point for the DLC. Which wouldn't surprise me, but I sure as hell hope that isn't the case, because I wouldn't want to be forced to beat Moog each time in order to enter the DLC. Or who knows, maybe the DLC will feature Moke, the Lord of Extra Blood, with even more random shit on the floor. Together with the Godskin Quintuplets uh, inside the Lake of Rod. Alright, now we're getting into the boss fights that I know practically nothing about. In fact, as far as I remember, I have only fought for the sex twice before. And I really don't enjoy nor understand this fight. I mean, it looks really cool visually, that's for sure. However, that's also a downside, because I have no fucking clue what's even going on. And I'm definitely not a fan of the whole timed lightning mechanic. 
And even though there is a small visual cue as to when it actually strikes your character, it is way too difficult to distinguish, especially if your eyesight isn't that great. So in other words, I neither really knew how to deal with the mechanics, nor have I ever really learned the boss's moveset. So understandably, I ran into some serious trouble when trying this fight with the Serpent Bone Blade or the Venomous Fang. I even tried hitting the head with the Viper Bite, or even using the reach of the Serpent Hunter. Because remember that the original idea was serpent based weapons. But then I found out that you can almost cheese this boss using a bow. Well, cheese is not really the right word, but it makes the fight significantly easier. Because for the majority of the fight at least, you can ignore the whole lighting mechanic. However, a downside is that since you're fighting him from a distance, the area around him is covered with death lightning. But fortunately that's only temporarily present. So after I avoided that, I just kept firing without any particular strategy. And... Uh, well, uh, evidently it worked. But hey, at least it looks really cool. So it's kind of a shame that the fight mechanically doesn't live up to its presentation. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. When it comes to Rudolph the Blue Orange Reindeer, I had honestly no idea what I got myself into, because other than my blind playthrough, and the Moon Only one, which made the fight rather straightforward, I had never fought this boss before, not even on level 1 on the regular new game. So I basically had to completely learn this fight from scratch. In fact, the extended moveset from absorbing spirit animals and healing multiple times took me uh, quite by surprise. Now granted I knew about the mechanic, but not exactly how it changed the boss's moveset. And also I didn't know that the boss could heal 3 times in a row. Making this quite a lengthy fight. Now fortunately the base moveset is quite easy to learn, and they were smart enough to give a boss that can heal itself a rather low health pool. Also when it comes to his hitboxes, they actually seem to be a little bit smaller than you would expect. Although I did notice when he does the sideways attack with his horns, twice in a row, even when you think you are already past the incoming hitbox of the second attack, after dodging the first one, you're still better off rolling the second attack anyway, which is not a hitbox issue, it's because he pulls his head back and he only moves sideways, he doesn't move further forward. Now, this boss is a big fan of teleporting, which is a bit annoying chasing him around such a big arena. However, not only do you get a ton of free hits while he is phasing into the ground, but you can actually still hit him when he visually has already disappeared. That's why I tend to spam L2 whenever he teleports. In fact, I almost managed to finish the fight early before the first heal. But I just couldn't get the final hits in after he reappeared again. <laughs> in fact, this happened twice in this fight. I'm not even sure if the healing can be interrupted. My assumption is that if you manage to stagger him while he's doing it, then that would in fact cancel it. Unless he is unstaggerable during the animation. But that would require something like Flame of the Red Mains, because uh, this weapon is not well suited to break a stance. Well, after the latest patch, uh, not even Flame of the Red Mains, probably. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha. 
Ah, fuck me, can you even believe that? A single digit of health left. And he was neither poisoned, nor could I get the final hit in before he could heal again. I mean, I can be kept in hindsight here by saying that I should have had the serpent bow equipped, but... Who would have expected this in the first place? Now, the extended moveset is not that terrible to deal with. Uh, the bunny hopping actually stops the moment you get behind him. The charge is quite dangerous, but you can actually outrun it in such a large area. However, the goat rolling move is a different story. That got me killed a lot, until I discovered that unlike uh, against the Godskin Noble, where rolling through his rolling requires very strict timing, for some reason against this boss, the timing is quite forgiving, and you can roll through his roll very consistently. So again, for some reason, this boss's hitboxes are a bit smaller than you would expect. But I guess that's a good thing, because I had uh, to roll through that uh, attack quite a lot of times. Because this reindeer ghost of Christmas past uh, just uh, didn't want to go down. So and then you need to jingle all the way- Okay, uh, this doesn't work. Uh, I'm up uploading this after Christmas after all, so... But I hope you had a Merry Christmas then. Or something, I don't know. Okay, just like the Ancestor Spirit, I have very little experience with Estelle, and this was my first time fighting him on a level 1 character. And, to be honest, the victory here came quite suddenly out of nowhere. Because I honestly was, uh, well, guessing with most of the timings. So it's quite peculiar that I even won at all. Regardless what I can say, is that Estelle is essentially the Medea of Elden Ring. Ironically, a lot more so than Clash of Dusex. But what I mean is that it's all about staying close to his head, since his moveset is designed to punish you for staying underneath him. So the difficulty here is twofold. First the timing on his bites, and as I said, I was guessing actually quite a bit here. Fortunately the grab is very much telegraphed with the purple lightning effect, and doesn't even have that large of a hitbox. Contrary to the other grab attack after he teleports, which can make you teleport from a mile away right into his hands. So, even if you think he won't be able to grab you, just uh, roll anyway, just to be sure. But the second difficulty with a large boss like this is, uh, well, obviously the camera. And in my experience, not locking on doesn't even help that much. Even though that does give you more camera control. But it doesn't really help you with hitting his head. At least not in my limited experience with this fight. In fact, when I do that, I tend to get stuck right behind his head a lot. So I ended up just locking on anyway. Now, when it comes to his giant meteor attack, um, as far as I can tell, it looks way more intimidating than it is. Because all I did to avoid it was to run sideways and somehow you're simply safe from it. So in that sense, it's very unlike Medir, whereas giant laser barrage is definitely as intimidating as it looks.
Well, I have footage from the fight against Rikert anyway, but it's just with the Serpent Hunter as intended. Remember that the original idea was serpent based weapons, so I never even considered one of the other weapons I've used so far. <laughs> and to be fair, on level 1, Nuke plus 7, I wouldn't have done that anyway. But uh, on top of that, uh, I don't really know much to say about Riker because uh, I kind of had no idea what I was doing uh, to begin with. And evidently, I didn't even need to. At least as long as he didn't happen to do the giant ground AoE. Because the only way I know of how to dodge it is by immediately running diagonally forward as the shockwave moves in a cone shape. But uh, that is either absurdly precise or simply inconsistent. However, he didn't do that to begin with in the successful attempt. So basically it all came down to just spamming R1 while holding a shield up, given that that gives you the highest DPS. After all, stun locking him with the weapon art has long since been patched out. Moreover, if you use the Twinbird Kite Shield for this, it stacks nicely with your damage boost from being in hyper mode. And then you basically have to occasionally dodge a bite or make sure that you're far enough away to avoid the poison, which has a more random pattern to it than I would like by the way. But if you're far enough away you should be fine at least. Now, when it comes to his second phase, I know even less about it. So, <laughs> it was actually kind of a surprise victory. Now, what's less surprising is that even this boss has delayed attacks. So that at least does prevent you from spamming mindlessly. As you have to make sure that you attack after his combo is finished. However, then I not only got a stagger, but afterwards he went uh, to charge his giant skull rain attack. And that evidently took him so long that I could finish him before the first skull even appeared. Also on top of that, what, what's up with the lava? Where exactly does the hitbox begin and end? Because there were moments where I thought I would die from the lava, but evidently didn't. I honestly have no idea. It's really hard to see where exactly it is or when it's supposed to be active, so to say. So, yeah, I don't really know what to make of this. <laughs> it's not the most exciting footage, I suppose. But uh, there you go, Rykat is included for once. Hey, at least it's the best made uh, gimmick boss that From Software has ever made. Oh boy, now we end with the fight that is the biggest obstacle for me. Well, other than Melania, of course. But the thing is that I'm really not good at fighting Radagon. Now, in previous cycles, I used Flame of the Red Mains, because especially on regular new game, you can use a specific pattern to cheese the ever-living fuck out of him, with only a little bit of RNG at the start. However, with his increased poise on the higher cycles, that becomes much more RNG heavy. And moreover, I didn't want to use it this time to begin with. Now, fortunately, the DPS of the Venomous Fang helps a lot, especially when you don't actually infuse it with poison, and then also use some additional buffs, which was definitely warranted in this case. But even after doing this, I'm still not uh, very skilled at this fight, to be honest. Now, I did figure out that one of the reasons that I often die very early in an attempt is because I tended to roll back and forth rather than from side to side, because his delayed overhead, that has an additional shockwave later on, can actually miss you altogether if you dodge strongly to the left. However, other than that, what tends to get me killed later on in the fight are the random teleports and as far as I can tell there's no trick or strategy that can help you with that. That's purely a matter of timing and reflexes and restraining yourself from rolling as a reaction to the initial teleport. Of course the worst thing about this fight is that you have to do it over and over and over again every time you die against the Elden Beast. I don't think it's a controversial opinion by now but I definitely think that Radagon and the Elden Beast individually would have benefited from being separate fights instead. They definitely would have gotten more appreciation from most people if that were the case, and at the very least from me. Well, to be fair, Elden Beast would still kinda suck just from the Elden Stars attack alone. Which is why I saved my Physic Flask, because I always just counter it by using the Whirlwind tier. And yes, I know it's possible to avoid it without it. And as some people have noticed on Discord back when I was doing this fight, I certainly tried. But ultimately I just got, uh, got fucking tired of how frustrating it can be. Either I wouldn't be in the right position when he did that attack, or I would be and I move past him in the correct method, only to then find out I was stuck against the invisible edge of the fucking arena. Or I would successfully uh, dodge and stay ahead of the Elden Stars, but then in the process getting hit by the boss's continuous attacks while I was being distracted by the Elden Stars. 
So yes, I am very aware that it is avoidable, but it, it is essentially like Melania's waterfall, even after successfully doing that weird turnaround uh, move. The freezing pot was looking as alluring as an alluring skull, and I guess the same thing simply applies to the world tier. Sometimes the easiest solution is to just say, nah, fuck it. <laughs>